So first up on Big Talk from Small Libraries 2024 is Megan Kowalski. Good morning, Megan. Good morning. And she is the Outreach and Reference Librarian at the University of the District of Columbia in Washington, D.C. And um, according to the info I hear, have here, um, FTE of about 2,800 at the moment. Yes. And she's going to teach about, talk about um, library instruction, teaching outside the box. Something that, um, even though this is coming from a uh, you know, academic library, I think all of us <laughs> are doing some sort of teaching in any type of library that we're in. So uh, go ahead, Megan, take it away. All right. Well, everyone, thank you for having me today. I'm going to do teaching outside the box, going beyond traditional library instruction. Uh, I can be brief with my intro since we covered that, but my name is Megan Kowalski and I'm the Outreach and Reference Librarian at the University of the District of Columbia. Uh, prior to taking this position, I was across town in D.C. at the Catholic University of America, where I held positions in technical services. So I've had that whole scope of library experience. Uh, but most importantly, at, in my job at at UDC, I do a lot of outreach and along with my colleagues, and right now there are only four other librarians, although we're hiring one more, um, we do also do a lot of instruction. And the University of the District of Columbia is the nation's only urban land grant institution. Our FTE currently is just under 3,000. Um, this is a change. Historically, UDC was closer to 10,000 and that was because way before my time, um, UDC was three institutions that combined to make one university of the District of Columbia. And we are essentially DC state school, although DC is not a state. Um, so that is something, you know, sometimes we get salty about, um, but we are um, one of the most affordable and the only public uh, higher ed learning institution in the district. We have a highly non-traditional student population that encompasses a diverse array of learners, both in terms of demographics and backgrounds and experience. The majority of our students are commuters simply because we do not have on-campus housing. We do contract out with some local apartment buildings, but we do not have dedicated student housing. And so most of our students are part-time. Um, they're also working or have caregiving responsibilities on top of their coursework. So this informs a lot of what we do on a daily basis. Um, so like many academic libraries, library and information literacy instruction at UDC is the one shot model if we're lucky. We are not required in any course and faculty are the ones to invite us in. We have a lovely little form they can fill out on our website or those who know us really well start to email us. Recently, we have started an opt out embedded program in our general education writing sequence to sort of uh, sneak into some classes we feel we should be in. Um, but most of our sessions are one shots. And in these one shots, like most of you who do library instruction, we are called to provide library orientation, teach, quote unquote, the databases, and focus on simple search strategies. And while our classes tend to be longer than the average um, college course, we generally get 60 to 70 minutes, um, sometimes even longer. Um, most of it is just the simple library orientation and teaching the databases. And library literature holds up this general look of the one-shot library instruction at most universities. And so in conjunction with two of my colleagues, one who I still currently work with, Catherine Meals, and one, Faith Rusk, who's since left left for San Francisco State University, but we love her, so we're never letting her go. Um, we are conducting a research project on how faculty design their student research assignments. And this came out of a, you know, quote unquote, bad research assignment. Essentially, a faculty member wanted a student to use three peer-reviewed resources on an assignment where peer-reviewed resources were not actually, you know, the correct source type to get that type of information. And so we wanted to better understand how faculty design their research assignments, conceive of research as a process, and then teach research to their students. And we did this through a survey and then ultimately interviews with introductory writing course faculty. And our findings show that teaching faculty are overburdened because they feel like they have to teach the entirety of the writing and research process in a 16 week period. They also don't know what students are coming into their classroom with due to academic siloing. And they've also, you know, discussed how their students come in with a vast array of experience from no experience whatsoever to great, they know exactly what they're doing. 
And this is further complicated by the fact that neither writing nor research are truly linear processes and they're intertwined, so they have to be taught at the same time. And then while the faculty are doing too much, we at the same time as librarians are underutilized and our expertise in research is overlooked. And so why are we underutilized? Well, as I mentioned earlier, we're only called in really to teach two things, and that is library orientation and database searching. And again, this is where the one shot is problematic because it neglects the complicated web that is the research process. And again, our findings are reinforced by long known anecdotes and existing research on what librarians are called to teach. And so this is a problem. Um, the information landscape is vast and ever changing. Generative AI has only sped things up in this area. And so ultimately search skills are the least we can do. I'm fond of telling my students that if you can search Amazon, you can search a library database. Those skills translate. I'm constantly saying, yeah, instead of saying peer reviewed, I want from you know, 2014 to 2024, you know, in this subject area, and I want it, you know, full text, you're picking you know, that's exactly the same as saying, I want prime delivery, I want it in black, and I want it this size. And so this is something we've always known, but as our work and our research has uncovered, you know, librarian expertise in the realm of information is drastically underutilized. At the same time, our faculty feel they are ill-equipped to teach this. Most faculty are never trained to teach. You know, not only are they not trained to teach in general, but they're specifically not trained to teach research, and thus they are overworked trying to learn as they go. And while the faculty we work with really do care and have expanded to become better teachers, this is a lot of burden on them when they already have a lot to deal with. Um, additionally, academic style research is a great and necessary skill to have, but most students won't use it once they graduate, or they won't have access to library materials, academic library materials, once they graduate. And so as academic libraries and experts on information, we can pivot. And so we can broaden what we teach to reinforce lifelong learning and transferable skills. So this means going beyond one shots, orientations, and you know, teaching the databases. And so there are several things that we can and should teach. And the first thing is the ACRL framework. And yes, you know, many of us have issues with this highly theoretical document, but it does have its uses. If you go down to it on a granular level and look at the dispositions and practices, those are things that can be turned into modular skills-based assignments that are both provided in the classroom through asynchronous learning materials or through things like webinars. And these concepts are transferable beyond academia. The one good thing about the framework is that it gets to the essential bedrock skills that any information literate person needs. It's not just for students, it's for everyone. Second, we can focus on career-based skills, and this helps with the library's return on investment for the campus. We don't usually make the university money. Libraries are often, you know, where money goes and does not come back out of. But we can show our big impact here on things like student retention, graduation, and employment rates. The library greatly benefits those on campus. And this is also a big motivator for students. Most students will not stay in academia. They want to focus on what will get them hired, and the library can help them develop those skills. Additionally, you can help build the workforce for your community. Lots of students stay in the area, and we should strive to help them create a strong and information literate community which supports everyone, not just the university, but the localized area and the greater economy. Intertwined with this is the also the idea of teaching lifelong learning skills. And this is where we can think of what do students need or what will they want after they leave? And this can vary from community to community and university to university. But essentially, how do we make information literate students? And how do we encourage students and faculty to have that forever curiosity where they just want to keep learning more about the world around them? And additionally, we want to think about things that have a personal connection. What are the students drawn to? Making things more relevant is something that is highly interesting. People want to work in things that they find interesting that they have a personal connection with. And you can get your students to see themselves as scholars and researchers and creators. You know, how many of us thought we were, you know, scholars with a capital S when we were undergrads? I'm going to guess not 
many. And that's simply because for so long, we've just been told, write a paper, turn it in, get it graded. But it goes beyond that, back to that ACRL framework of scholarship as a conversation. And finding that personal connection can help students see themselves as scholars. Plus, the bonus of this is that teaching stuff in this area makes the library seem more likable and more approachable. And so how do we do it? On top of our traditional classroom instruction, which tends to focus on foundational skills in course tailored instruction, we can incorporate other methods. And first, the obvious one is webinars. These are fairly easy to implement. You just need something like a Zoom or a YouTube account to save videos and share recordings. They're also incredibly flexible. You can pick a time, any time, you know, day, night, you can pre-record things, you know, pick a length, adjust as needed. You can make it work for you. You can also do short videos or long videos. At our library, we host monthly webinars, both for students and faculties. In fact, we have one later today. And these can vary in length from as short as 15 minutes to as long as an hour, depending on how the Q&A goes. These are also scalable and sustainable because you can reuse material. Each semester, I do provide a library orientation webinar that I simply update with new material that our students need to know each semester. But that just means tweaking slides that I already have. So this is an easy way to create content for your library in a sustainable manner. And finally, the biggest benefit of webinars is that they can be recorded and shared. Oftentimes, webinars that we provide to our students and faculty, the live attendance is not that high, but over time, the attendance on or the view rates on the videos on our YouTube page ticks up and up. Next, you can think of things like workshops, and I know a lot of us had to stop things during, you know, when COVID started, but now we can really get back into these. And this is a chance to provide some hands-on time. And the benefit of workshops is that they tend to be conversation-driven. Q&A just works better in person sometimes, simply because you're not talking to black boxes on a screen. It also lets you hear from your community. People in a room will share things with you. It's just what happens when people get together. They talk. And it's also some people prefer in person. I remember when we had to take all of our services and put them online, so many of our students who we connected with in person, they said, I can't wait till you'll reopen again. It's just so much easier to talk to you in person. It's also a chance to provide a tactile experience. Some folks are tactile learners, so they benefit being able to get their hands into things, try things out, work side by side with you. And this is a chance to give them that sort of learning opportunity. You can also consider for both webinars, online instruction, and things like workshops, doing this through community and campus partnerships. And these can be held not only at your library or on your campus, but out in your greater community. And some places you can look at for these partnerships, if you're an academic library, the obvious one is, you know, the schools, departments, and programs on campus, and essentially looking at what does that niche student need. If you're a public library, working with the other organizations that are within your local government, you know, if you of a Parks and Rec Center or things like that, working with them. Other places are working with career services. Most universities have a career services department and most communities have some of workforce development area. And you can work with them to integrate library skills and information literacy instruction into these sort of programs. If you also have any sort of EDI and diversity initiatives or organizations, those are great ones to work with. You can also look at student affinity groups. And these are not just at campus universities, but high schools will have these as well. And these vary greatly from school to school, and they tend to be highly niche, but smaller events. And these are sometimes a good chance to get more personal and provide that personal connection that a lot of students and others are looking at. You know, if you're a university, you can also work with a PAC public library and vice versa. I am um, routinely reaching out to the DC Public Library to be like, hey, how can we support one another? Another place to consider that I think is often overlooked in some instances is daycares. And a lot of these daycares also have parent groups. For example, I'm actually going to be doing a webinar on, you know, how to preserve children's, you know, art objects later this summer for uh, my, my kiddos daycare. Um, and that's something that can be recorded and shared again. And so local organizations love having that you know added thing they can say hey we're not going to charge you for this fun event come attend and related to that you can also look at local businesses so you know literally who's outside your door who's outside your campus what do they want how can you work with them and the bonus of working through these campus and community partnerships is that it helps place the library as a part of the community. And this can also, particularly with academic libraries, help with student admissions and retentions. 
Plus, you can also work with your alumni networks, which can increase donations. And if you're a public library, same thing. You can work with your friends groups. The more fully integrated you are into the community, the easier it is to get money because people know you and like you. And so when it comes to stepping outside the box, it doesn't hurt just to try something once. If it doesn't work, you can revise it and try again or try a new idea. And this, you know, it's okay to fail. You know, not only is it good for libraries to try something and be like, okay, that didn't work, let's try again. It also models failure, particularly if you're an academic library, be like, failure is okay. We grow from learning from our mistakes. And so in terms of ideas, I want to start with the slightly non-traditional. These are pretty related to what we already do, but they go beyond library orientation and database searching. So many libraries might already do something like this, but those of us, particularly in smaller libraries where we only have, you know, those one shots, this is a way we can broaden our reach. And at UDC, we have a tendency to work with our faculty and be like, ask, okay, what do you want? And then be like, okay, we're gonna slip in these other skills. Cause more often than not, they say something like, I want you to teach library orientation and the databases. And we're like, we get the assignment, we get the syllabus. And we're like, yeah, we're gonna slip these other fundamental skills in there as well. And so you can offer these in classroom instruction and in workshops or specifically in webinars, uh, simply because those are so scalable. And so the first thing you might want to think of is doing something along the lines of the library versus everything else. So what's in an academic library or a public library versus elsewhere? A lot of students don't know why an academic library is different. You know, oftentimes they're told by their professors, go to the library. They don't understand the why behind it. And this is a chance to showcase how information changes. Play, you know, depending on where it is. I'm constantly telling students, you come to the library for these kinds of resources and support helping you get access to these other kinds of resources. And holding a webinar on this can help people situate where information lives within the greater information landscape. And that rolls into the idea of, you know, the kind of information, you know, what's available, where to find it, and how to use it. This gets at the idea that different information does different things. And this is extremely useful for people, particularly after they leave academia. And you can also talk about things like research efficiency. We can all save time. As research experts, we librarians have the tools and knowledge to share to help save students time and frustration. Our library recently did a top three tips for research efficiency webinar. It was short and sweet. We only had one or two people attend live. But it's already crossed over uh, the 25 view count threshold. And I only posted that a few days ago to our YouTube page. So that one is we know is going to have a long tail because people are always looking for ways to be more efficient in what they do because we're incredibly busy. And sort of related to that is the idea of research management. What to do with all the things, you know, talking about folder and file organization, naming structure, citation managers. Lots of students don't know how, you know, to organize this information or the why behind, you know, why is this a good idea? I read a very interesting article a while back that talked about search has gotten so good that people are just used to naming their file, whatever, throwing everything in one folder and then searching for it when they need it. But the problem is when it comes to research, things can get really, really muddled, particularly if you don't have access access to do something like a full text search. So this is highly transferable to work in life because the idea of organizing information is not just related to academic research, but in general, how we just organize the information in our lives and in our work. Something that is a little bit academic, but can be broadened out is the idea of teaching a course on how to read X. So how to read an academic article, how to be, read a business report, how to read a memo. Lots of people learn this simply by doing it, but we can help jumpstart the process. And in doing an instruction like this, we can go through each part you know, of a piece of writing. So we can take an academic article and say, this is what a methodology is. This is what a discussion is. These are what analysis is and go through each part and explain what it is, why it's there, what's in, what it is important for, and what it does. And this can be a bit meta, but it helps our students and anyone who attends these programs become deeper critical thinkers. 
Some more slightly non-traditional ideas is the idea of personal archiving. We all have the stuff of life, but what the heck do we do with it? I did this as a webinar, um, and this came out of a discussion I had with a faculty member. She was teaching a course on global archives and was originally just asking, I would like the library to come in to talk about the library, you know, the basic library orientation, and then another one of our faculty members come in and talk about the university archives. And when we started to talk, I was like, I think I'd like to come in and provide a workshop on personal archiving. And she thought that was a great idea. And this has since been self-perpetuating. It has turned into our most watched webinar to date. I am doing it again. I am adapting this again for my daughter's daycare. But what's interesting about this is it gets people to think about how they are the archivists of their own life and the storyteller of their own life. And what does it mean to take the stuff, all the photos, all the files, the recipes, whatever it is that matters to them, and make a story out of it and make a personal archive out of it and save it for the future. These are essential library skills that people don't think about and that can be transferred to life. Um, and so this is something I've actually taken a lot of teaching on. And so um, if you're interested, if you go to the UDC uh, YouTube, UDC Library YouTube page, you can watch this webinar and we will be offering it again this summer simply because it has become so popular. And as an HBCU, I'm fond of saying the new um, African American History Museum in downtown DC created its collection out of people's attics and basements simply because those families had saved those objects. And so making that personal connections to our students, since we are an HBCU, has really changed how people think about how they organize this material in their life. And then we can also talk about things like search resiliency, again, modeling failure and recovery. And this can also help with the anxiety around failure of research. You know, people think it doesn't exist if I don't find it the first time, when simply, oh, it, it just didn't work that time. Let's try something else. And so when we go through search resiliency, we can show how not everything works and we need to adapt what we're doing or search techniques to fit what we're looking for. And this, again, very transferable to life and business. And one that is growing in importance, sadly, is misinformation. And a program like this can be essential in saying not only what is misinformation, why it is, but also how to determine if something is a piece of misinformation. And sadly, this is going to be incredibly important this year um, going into an election year. But this gets to the heart of what it means to be information literate is figuring out, OK, what is true and verifiable and what is not. And tangled all right up in that is the idea of chat GPT and other generative AI. And I'm thinking here specifically of prompt engineering. Search is changing, and this is what's next. Focus on what it can be used for. You know, we know students are going to use chat, chat GPT and things like that anyway, so we might as well focus on teaching them how to do it the quote unquote right way. Essentially, the beneficial way that isn't plagiarism, that isn't cheating, but does get to the heart of these tools can be useful. So how can they be most useful to you? And then this rolls it right into the idea that research is messy. You know, what does the research process actually look like? It's not linear. People think that it is. So we can talk about how research is, you know, this big ball of to steal from Doctor Who, timey wimey research stuff. And we can help modularize, you know, a complete and incredibly messy process. And so before I jump into getting to the non-traditional outside of the box teaching things, I wanna use this last point on research is messy to share this graphic I made and share it for fun. You know, how many of us follow the traditional methods of research these days? You know, we librarians highly trained in this. I'm gonna guess not many. We know it's messy and we have our own tricks and methods and ways of organization. Teaching outside the box or moving beyond the traditional, you walk in, teach this, 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 and leave instruction can give a great behind the scenes look at how librarians work. We can demystify what we do, which is a good way to connect to folks more personally to research. Because research is an art, it's not a science. There's no you know, one fully right answer most of the time. There's no one way to do it. Everyone develops their own methods. And so showing people to be like, okay, I'm teaching you this way, but here's this other skill you might wanna try can be useful. And so now moving on to some more outside the box stuff. This is all tangentially related to what we do, but it seems like less of a focus. But in the end, it's all working with information and the skills that we as librarians have. 
So one of the big things you can do, and I've done this before as an academic library, is simply holding a webinar on, I need something to read. You know, how in the heck do we find new books? This one gets personal for people and they also have fun. You know, it's, it's interesting to see what people share when they're like, oh wait, I heard this, how do I find that? And so we can talk about how do you track down books? How do you find recommendations and things like that? We can also do something on photography skills, and this is a connection to visual literacy. We communicate these days through photos and how we present material through places like Instagram. And so this is useful for our students going into the workforce when they have to think literally about their image. And so this can be useful to discuss, you know, here's how you can use photography in your life. This is great for uh, parents who think, I wanna take better photos of my kids. Another great one for life is creating your news diet. There's too much news these days. We can share how to make things digestible and manageable. We can discuss where to go, how to find balance, how to keep up, and how to make things sustainable. Another one is how to start a newsletter. I'm specifically thinking of Substack. There are so many platforms out there, it doesn't matter. These days, students and faculty need a portfolio or a way to market their work. And some people just like to share. We can share the what, the why, and the how of why you might want to compose a newsletter. Things like doing audience research, who would you talk to, developing your content model, and things like that. Big focus here is on writing and research of how to support getting something like this up and running. Somewhat related to this is the idea of public speaking. Again, communication is a key workforce skill, and we can cover the basics. Even things like how to organize a presentation or a speech, or how to do things like integrate a signal phrase when you're going to use research in a discussion. Again, that's a core research skill. But we're presenting it in an out-of-the-box way. Sort of related to some of these is also the idea of developing a personal website. Again, people these days need a place to market themselves and academics, you know, definitely need a place to store, you know, their CV and their articles and their links and all of that. And so getting at the core idea of how do you want to present information about yourself in a publicly accessible way. Tied into this is the idea of LinkedIn. This is the professional social media, but it is growing in importance. And this is a great opportunity for collaboration across departments or with other businesses, because this is where you can talk about scholarship as a conversation. Once you are up and running on LinkedIn, sometimes LinkedIn themselves will be like, hey, we think you're an expert in this area. Please share your expertise on this forum. And so again, you can discuss the idea that you know, framework idea of scholarship as a conversation, but in a way that targets career-based skills, and that's incredibly useful to people. Also incredibly useful is financial literacy. This is, again, an essential form of literacy, and it's a great opportunity for collaboration either with the local business or with, you know, various departments on a campus. One I really want to target this year is anything voting, elections, or politics based. You know, you can talk about researching the candidates, how to register to vote, how to get involved in local politics, you know, finding all of those groups for, you know, all of those ballot initiatives, things like that. We want an informed populace and we can provide the basic skills for students and others to not only figure out how they want to get involved, but then research the ideas and the candidates that are happening here. And we can also focus on things like finding local events. How many of us know what is going on locally or the news in our community? We can find how to share, you know, we can share how to find these things, you know, make lists of news websites and share those and things like that. And so this is just a few of the ideas for outside of the box. It's by no means exhaustive because every library is different. And so when it comes to finding you know, what you want to teach, you have to look at the population you are serving. So there are a couple of ways you can get new ideas. And the first one is pull your staff. You know, what skills do they have that, you know, they might want to share? People have those hidden skills and it's always useful to just ask and be like, hey, what could you do a presentation on? And I would say, don't limit this to just your teaching or reference librarians. You'd be surprised what people are excited to share. You can also look at what are vendors offering that you could recreate and tailor for your specific audience. Everyone has webinars these days, and we can use those ideas to spark webinars for our specific target communities. You can also look at your book and reading list. You know, this feels obvious, but I think it needs to be said. We can pull ideas from whatever we are reading, both for work and in our personal lives, and come up with content ideas that way. You can also parse the ACRL framework itself. 
we made this a summer project at UDC. Um, for every week through a summer on Friday, we sat down with one frame and literally went line by line thinking of ideas and lessons to either do specific activities for, you know, one disposition or one bullet point or entire lessons, you know, wrapping that entire frame up. And my colleagues and I, we did write an article for this um, for College and Research Libraries News. And so that is available online if you are interested in adapting that for your specific library. You can also think about what's happening in your community, you know, looking at the local news, whether it's, you know, highly local, hyper specific, or thinking state level, national, or even global, and thinking, you know, what are people paying attention to and what do they care about? Um, I'm just thinking yesterday we had that AT&T cell service outage. Maybe we want to talk about things of how do you communicate without a cell phone? We've kind of forgotten how to do that. And that's something we can do as a library is teach the skills of, well, how do you get around this slightly, you know, information blackout? People care about what's happening around them. And so if you see what your community cares about, you can develop something around that. And finally, you can just ask your community. If you just ask, people will tell you. There's always going to be someone to be like, I have a thought for that. And so it never hurts to ask. And so there are several bonus benefits to moving beyond traditional library instruction. First, it can improve or reinforce your brand. What do you want your community to think about you? We at the UDC Library have become known as the helpful place um, simply because no matter what's happening on campus, people know they can come to the library to get help. Um, you know, we have people in person, we have people online, we pick up the phone, we answer emails, so people know we can connect them to what they need. And so I've leaned into that. And so we are constantly being like, how can we be more of the helpful place? And so you can use events like this to really lean into the brand image you have created for yourself. You can also strengthen your connections across the campus or across your community. And you can, you know, this can help remind people not only what you normally do, but what they can come to you for. Oftentimes we found with faculty when we're discussing how to develop content for a library instruction session, they're like, I didn't know you did that. It's, it's simply, they just didn't know. And so the more we do this, the more people come to see us as these information experts who can do more than just teach the databases or library orientation. Doing something like this can also reaffirm the library as a place for support, as literally a place people can go to and as helpful and friendly. Again, that brand image, but it's just reminding people, this is what we are here for. This is what we can do. And for academic libraries, this can show that the library is an essential partner when it comes to student admissions, retention, and alumni relations. And those three areas are where the money is. And since the library is often, again, we are not a place that makes money, this is a way to show how spending money at the library is well spent because the return on investment is so high. And so I wanted to leave plenty of times for Q&A. Um, so I want to, again, thank you for having me today. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I will have the slides for my presentation up on my website later this afternoon, and that is listed here on the website. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Great. Thank you, Megan. Um, all right, here. Uh, yes, and we will. Um, ah, there's a link there. We will link to your website for those slides for our archive as well. That's what I was trying to say. Because <laughs> um, we do provide when we are um, recording the day. And um, unless otherwise noted, all of our sessions, our sessions um, will be posted to the Nebraska Library Commission's YouTube channel for the video for the sh um, archive. And then slides and presentations and handouts, um, it will vary, depends on where they are. So in this case, we will link out to um, Megan's website. You'll be able to find her slides there. Um, so if anybody does have any questions, please uh, type into your questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. As she said, we have plenty of time to answer any questions you have. Um, questions, thoughts, um, any ideas you have uh, for interesting training you've done in your libraries. Um, as you mentioned earlier in your session, Megan, you know, we um, you know, share and borrow, um, but my, uh, my director here says we are indeed that. Um, rip off and duplicate <laughs> in the nicest way. <laughs> um, what um, I other am constantly looking at what other libraries are doing to be like, oh, oh, that's a good thing. I'm going to steal that idea. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, we as libraries are like, take it, take my idea, run with it. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, 
So we did have a question earlier at the beginning that I didn't catch, but um, that's fine. And if someone doesn't know, and I, I get this because if you're not in um, the academic world, you might not know. Um, what um, I know, but if you want to explain, what does ACRL stand for and what does ACRL do? Yes. So it's the Association of College and Research Libraries. It's basically American Library Association, but this one's for college and research libraries um, that they've they're basically our big professional ALA. Um, they have a major conference every two years where it's a bunch of academic librarians in a room. Fascinating work going on there sometimes. Because um, the way it's different from ALA is that a lot of academic librarians are considered faculty, so we do go out and do our own research and stuff. That's not the case for every university. In fact, my prior position was not a faculty position. Um, but that's that's what ACRL is. And the framework I was mentioning, it's the ACRL framework for information literacy in higher education. Essentially, how do we make information literate citizens? And so they have it broken down into these big ideas of what information literacy is, and it's very theoretical. It's a, an incredibly difficult document to take and make something that is active learning in the classroom. Yeah. And so it breaks it down into specific, you know, an information literacy or an information literate person does this, you know, a person who is a, an advanced learner does this. And um, it's taking these big theoretical ideas and parsing them into specific hands-on activities is incredibly difficult, which is why my colleagues and I have often been like, we did that summer project where we sat down and we're like, okay, how do we make these into actual teachable lessons? Um, and we've turned a few of those things into webinars. We've done things in the classroom. Um, it's basically immersing our students in the world of research in a way that it can connect these theoretical concepts. And one of my favorite ones, and unfortunately I didn't get to do because I was on uh, maternity leave, but my colleagues, they put you know different things on a beach ball. And um, there's this thing called the ACRL sandbox where people can share these activities. And so these things on a beach ball, the students would grab it and what their hands were touching, they had to be like, okay, how can I put these two sources these two random sources in conversation with one another. Um, and so it's getting at the idea of how do you integrate information from various areas? One of my colleagues wanted to do what they call source areas super areas that you never have um, thought that anything yeah. to do with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Really it's, it's, box. yeah. it's really engaging our students in such a way like I'm trying to now teach citations as a form of TikTok video um, simply because I was like, I'm telling students, you know, when you stitch something or when you duet something on TikTok, that's getting at the idea of scholarship as a conversation, but you're also citing what that information came from. And so that it's is. trying oh to get students gosh, to think, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And again, part of that idea was stolen from another library. And so this is why um, information literacy and library instruction, when we're often called in, it's like, yeah, the lab here's the library, this is what we do, here's our databases, here's how to search them. That's what we're traditionally called for. And students, it, it's fine. You know, some, some of them get some stuff out of it, some of them don't. And so it's just a way to make it, oh, no, I actually need this in life. Because most students, when they leave, they're like, I'm never going to need APA again. Why do I have to you know, pay attention to APA citation. But when you say, hey, you know, a TikTok video is a form of citation, they start to think, oh, it's it's the concepts that we want to focus on, those foundational core skills that everybody needs. Making, them, making it relatable and relevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right, so we have some questions popping in here. Let's see here. Um, <laughs> oh, you had done, mentioned, uh, mentioned your, uh, session you do at daycares. They want to know, um, are, so are your slides for that presentation on your website? So let's know if you'd be willing to share those slides. So those are, that's something I'm doing this upcoming summer. Um, okay, so yeah, they okay. don't exist yet, but they will be on my website. It is something um, they're also going to record. Um, so that, that recording will be available as well. But essentially, I'm taking the personal archiving webinar that is available on the UDC Library's YouTube page that's already available, but I'm giving it a parent's spin to be like this is what you do with your kids art this is what you do with all the photos on your phone um simply because talking with you know my kiddos you know their parents it's it's funny how many of them are like oh the stack of kids art is unwieldy what the heck do i do with it and um our daycare is wonderful and they've been doing these parent-based classes you know some things are like oh here are some engaging activities you can do with your kid that are art based and things like that but this summer um one of the teachers wanted to talk about you know what, do, what how can you turn your kids art into art you actually want to hang on your wall and i was like when she 
we were talking about this. I was like, can I do a personal archiving workshop simply because people need to know. Like, I remember when I was growing up, my parents had, my, my dad's a librarian, so obviously he thought like this, you know, they had a bin of the art they saved, but you can't save everything. Um, yeah. I didn't know just how much art kids generate until I had one of my own. <laughs> my husband and I have to go through it monthly because it's a stack, you know, that's like three inches high. And right. then each month we're going through, and then once a year we go through and see what we already saved to be like, okay, is that still worth saving? And these are things that people don't, obviously think about. And so it's building in a way to make, you know, managing all of the artifacts of our lives manageable. So that webinar will be up. It's just, it's, it's happening in July. So TBD. Yeah. Um, and that's, yeah, kids are so creative. They are always mm -hmm. pushing out things like that. Yeah. All right. So keep an eye on her website then, and um, you'll be able to get that. Yeah. Uh, all right, so let's see, uh, do, does your faculty, here's the next question, does your faculty share your webinars in their classes, or how do you get students to watch them? Um, do you embed them in the LMS, or? So a lot of our webinars are designed, um, we have, we target two audiences. We design webinars for students and then another subset for faculty. Everyone's invited to go to them, but that's just how we target them. Um, they are hosted, we are a SpringShare library, so we use the LibApp suite. So we have an events page where everything is listed. But when it comes to the actual content, I'm just marketing it through social media, through our newsletter and things like that. Um, we also, for our faculty-driven ones, we focus it, um, we have a center for teaching and learning. And so we co-market through them because faculty pay a little bit more attention to them sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. But depending on the content, I have the ability to email all students and faculty. Don't tell my university. Um, <laughs> and so I will send out these targeted emails to be like, shoot out these webinars to all faculty, these webinars to all students. Students show up sometimes and we are prepared for that. But what we do notice is our, we post all of the recordings on YouTube and those videos when students when we do this embedded librarian program or we're working with our faculty, we're like, hey, here's an asynchronous video you can share ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And so we can reuse that webinar content um, or we create tutorial videos. Um, and right now the plagiarism one I made at the start of the pandemic, which is not very pretty because I was just trying to get it up there, yeah. is our most watched video simply because our faculty have literally used it. We are Blackboard as our um, learning management system and they can embed it directly in their classes. And so when faculty reach out to us or we see a need, we're like, hey, we already have this video. Go ahead and embed it into your YouTube uh, or embed it into your Blackboard course. And that's how we get a lot of these videos in there. And it's one reason why we're okay with our webinars being shorter because it makes them more shareable after the fact. Like people go on to YouTube and they're like, oh, a one hour webinar? I don't know if I wanna see that. It's so long, but 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Watch it at two times speed. Suddenly that's, you know, manageable. So we don't really sweat if we don't get a lot of attendance live because we know we're going to get more views after the fact. So we're constantly yeah. telling people sign up. You'll get the direct link after as long as you're registered. But that's why we house everything on our YouTube, simply because it makes things more shareable and thus more sustainable. Yeah. And is that is your YouTube? Are those publicly available to anyone to go in? Yes. And borrow? OK, yes. great. And our webinars, anyone can attend. We have not locked anything down. Um, we're not worried about there being a race and us crashing our Zoom room. We're not worried about that. Yeah. Um, we have the same thing here. Yeah, we've noticed that um, we do a weekly, I do a weekly webinar series here and Compass Live, a show which is free and open to anyone to attend. Um, of course, librarians are mostly interested in it. <laughs> um, but yes, we've noticed the same thing that our um, archives get way more views than the live show. And that's fine. I know not yep. everybody can be available at 10 a.m. Wednesday mornings, 10 a.m. Central Time Wednesday mornings. Um, I, just, I just care that the information is out there for someone to use and benefit from in whatever way works best for them. Yeah, that's exactly what we think. We're, we're, we want the content to get out there, not necessarily the live view, which is why we also always share our email at the end to be like, hey, get questions. Go ahead and email us. Um, you know, that's another way we want to reach people um, is simply to be like, here's the content. If you have questions afterwards, we're here to help. Yeah. All right. So we have a few more questions here. I want to get through. Um, someone says, I'm interested in your library 101 course on Blackboard. Um, can you share that content or structure or is that somewhere? So library 101 is it at the start of the pandemic. Um, sadly, we were also down in our information literacy librarian because her spouse moved. Bummer. Um, 
we needed to create some asynchronous learning material. So what we had, what we did is we created these very short learning modules, breaking down various concepts of research into what we hoped would be, you know, if you did each one, it was less than five minutes. And it's a mix of text, downloadable flyers, videos, and things like that. It is housed in our Blackboard. And unfortunately, we can't share, you know, can't just yeah, export BSD. that. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I can see about exporting the entire thing, but I'm not quite sure. That said, if there's one specific subject you're interested in, I can cut and paste that stuff. Or I can send the videos that are housed in Blackboard are all on our YouTube. Um, so if there's some specific concept you're interested in, um, or I can create an outline of what we've covered, um, I'm happy to share that. Yeah, so check the YouTube and see if there's if something you're looking for is there. Um, otherwise, yeah, reach out to Megan and see if there's something specific you want. Um, Oh, that's a nice, co oh, nice comment just came in. Um, someone said, yes, I'd love the outline. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so Rochelle, yeah, reach out to Megan. Um, there's your info there. Send her an email and I'm sure she'll um, be, get that. And the you. nice thing about that is it, we have made it as an organization on Blackboard, meaning it's perpetual. It doesn't end each semester like a course would. And so mm -hmm. we can also add new material. And so I have a whole list of new modules I want to add, including one on misinformation, um, you know, simply as time permits. But it, it's helped us be like, oh, faculty want this stuff, but they don't want us to teach in their classroom. At least we can reach out and say, hey, assign this. And so we can enroll students. In fact, many faculty have gotten used to at the start of the semester, they send me their entire roster of students. I enroll them in Library 101. They stay enrolled until they leave the university. It's ungraded, but we have quizzes after each module so students can test themselves. And we've made it easy. It's only like four or five questions. They can take it as many times as they want. But faculty have taken to using this as extra credit. So it's really helpful for their students to at least attempt to immerse them in those skills that they might not have otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, all right. Great. So yeah, I'm sure you'll be hearing from at least one person. <laughs> um, let's see another question here. I know you have non-traditional student population, uh, but have you ever thought about offering a webinar like Life Skills 101? Yes. Um, it, it, simply a yes. It's it's defining what life skills are most important right now. Um, we jokingly say our students are every age of 17 to 70, but it's not so much a joke, the number of students who have come up to me and said, hey, today's my 70th birthday. And so it's like life skills look different when you're 17 versus when you're 70. Um, and so it's trying to figure out who do we work with? Like, the library, we can work more closely with career services, but a student applying for, say, an internship on the Hill is going to look different than a 70 year old who's thinking, I'm just back here and now I just want a part time job. Um, and so it's it's figuring out those life skills. But one thing we have learned is a lot. Almost all of our students come in and they're first time academics, first time in college. Uh, we do have some coming back for second degrees, but they're so divorced from their first degree that mm. the whole skill like the online learning management system, computers, you know, I had someone the other day said, I typed my first papers on a typewriter. What is the citation footnoting at the bottom automatic, you know, magic that is happening. And so developing those, you know, study skills, navigating academia is a life skill. The number of students who come to the library just looking for help being like, who the heck do I go to if I have a question about my account? Um, that's that's why the library is considered the helpful place, because we have those connections to be like, you can go here and talk to this person. Great. That's there are lots of resources, depending. Yeah. And yeah, you do have such a range. And that's similar yeah. to the public library. I think you have yeah. people from all those. So that'd be a similar thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right, looks like someone here is looking for more advice in this question. Um, it's kind of, kind of long. Uh, in a small town public library, getting attention and input has been my roadblock. We don't know how to accomplish getting participation. We partner with groups who are presenting all kinds of information and programs that locals say they want, um, invest our own time and resources, but attendance is so limited. Trying to offer hybrid options so people can consume on their own time is one option, but getting recognition of ROI when they haven't shown up that's mm -hmm. an issue yeah so uh this is always hard we've all had events that people just don't show up to and it's mm -hmm. it's really annoying when people say i want it i want it i want it and then they don't show up um yeah. and unfortunately that's a problem for every library small libraries big libraries it, it just happens and this is where we sort of have to just get okay sitting in our failure sometimes um 
Some things to ask is, do you assess those events after the fact for the people who do show up? Was it they asked for the event, but the timing didn't work? Was it, you know, the timing was fine, but, you know, they needed online or whatever. And it's also sometimes, particularly in smaller libraries, child care. People might want to come to things, but if they don't have child care um, and libraries cannot be daycares. Um, and so that that's a hard one. Um, yeah. And so sometimes trying to partner with someone who may be able to provide child care can be helpful um, simply because a lot of people want to come to these events, but they want to be able to focus and they can't do that if their kid is hanging on them. Uh, and so that's one thing. Another thing you can look at for ROI, particularly with hybrid events, is make sure that monthly you're seeing, okay, how are those recordings doing? And then pushing it, that out. You can push out old stuff. I'm constantly being like, oh, hey, remember this webinar I did on personal archiving? You can watch it again. Um, that's one way to do it. Um, and so it the ROI can look different ways. Yeah, you can focus on we spent X amount of dollars per person. That's one thing you can do, but you can also think of the greater impact. You know, um, what was the benefit to the community? Talk, if you can find people who attended to be like, what did you get out of this? How did you change? The number of people who go to local library events for things in like entrepreneurship, who then go on to start businesses, or I've seen local libraries do things on, you know, hi, I'm thinking of running for office. What do I do about that? How many of them actually became candidates and may have been elected? Things like that. You can look at ROI differently. Um, when it comes to outreach, a lot of it is how do you spin it? How do you put the spin on that story to make it work for you? Because when it comes to telling the story of the library, yeah, there are numbers, but you want to focus more on the people you helped. So it's that storytelling that really makes it settling. Because oftentimes, particularly when you're writing reports, numbers mean nothing. Like, I, I don't know what that means in context. The story is what has the impact. And so um, that's how sometimes you can talk about ROI is what's the long tail on this event, you know, or did people talk about it afterwards? Was it covered in the news? Like there are different ways. Did people talk about it on social media? What did it do for the library's brand image? Something like that. Um, and so it depends more on each event, but those are some ways you can sort of put a spin on it to be like, well, it might not have gotten a lot of live attendance, but this is the other thing it did do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you do have to kind of, I mean, it's, it's what you've been saying the whole time, think outside the box. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and yeah, that, um, that's I do keep statistics, like I said, on our archive shows too. Those are just as useful and just, um, as valid in as um, doing the live things and having the, the bodies come into the building. Um, and I think that's something um, that you do need to teach maybe people that don't realize that, um, that uh, just because they did, we didn't use the other bodies in the building didn't, didn't mean, doesn't mean we weren't getting um, the information out that we weren't uh, helping people, that people weren't benefiting and, and particip participating in a new way in what we've been providing. Yeah, and a sneaky yeah. way you can do it is be like, we did an event on this topic. Did we see an increase on checkouts or use of items related to that topic? Right. Um, yeah. You know, that's For, another uh, way you can make that connection. Yeah. yeah. The results, the response, absolutely. Because even if people don't attend, they might be like, oh, wait, no, I have been interested in learning more about it. Let me put all these books on hold. All right. Um, I think we'll do one more question here since we are getting to the end of this hour. Um, oh, okay. So it says, I think you might have mentioned this earlier, but um, I guess we'll clarify because of the, the, the comment here. Uh, when it comes to your Library 101 course, can anyone sign up for it or do you have to be registered through the school? Sadly, it um, is. It is locked down to UDC students and faculty. Okay. It's it's tied into our learning management system. Um, we have thought about converting it over to our website because Springshare would let us make these quizzes and modules, but the problem, one, that's a lot of work. Um, and two, Blackboard is where our students and faculty already are. Um, it is much easier to get them to pay attention on Blackboard than it is to have them dive three layers deep into our website to find that. Mm -hmm. Makes sense, makes sense, because they were just saying it could be helpful for high school seniors heading to the post-secondary academia world, um, but it would depend on if they are, um, you know, uh, coming to your university or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because a lot of the things we link to are like, go to these databases, those aren't available to people who aren't at our university. 
True, true. Yes. All right. Um, okay. All right. All right. Um, that's the last question I think we'll take. Would you just do have a comment, which I think is, it applies to you and possibly everyone who's presenting here today. Uh, someone just says, for being an unsure and horribly afraid of doing your own recording, I am thankful that there are people out there who are brave enough to do so and generous enough to let us share them. Yeah. And when we do our recordings, you know, some videos is just recorded narrations on um, PowerPoint that we turn into a video. Sometimes we literally just set up a Zoom room and record that way. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Um, I do have a Canva Pro account that eventually I'm going to get around to making some really nice videos. But again, making nice video content takes time. So we're starting with a little yeah, hanging fruit. Time. It takes yeah. more time than you would think. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. I think we'll wrap it up here because we've got um, about a few more minutes before the, the next session is to start. So thank you so much, Megan. This was great, useful information. Everyone go check out her website. That's where her links will be on the recording. For this will be available and we'll link to that as well. Or her slides will be. Ah, there we go. All right. All right. I am going to pull presenter control back to my screen. So thank you so much, Megan. Stick around and watch the rest of the um, conference if you like.